It's October 31st, the end of another month, so time for the workshop vlog. Let's do it. Okay, so I have a number of questions that I have to answer that you guys sent me in, but before I do that, I have a question that I'm most commonly asked. Now, I know I've done this in multiple workshop vlogs before, but I'll do it again because it seems to be the most common question about the dust extraction system and some questions about the air filter and about the miter saw and how well the dust extraction works there. So I've done a little bit of um, chopping and changing, not much, I've just sorted out the blast gates and stuff on the dust extraction system. It's working absolutely perfect. So I'll give you a quick rundown on that again. I'll give you a little demonstration on it to show you how well it works and the DX4000 dust extractor. Yes, it is powerful enough to do the dust extraction system. So let me demonstrate that for everybody that's new here. For you guys that are probably watching the channel since it's begun, you've probably seen this about 10 times. I apologize. I'm just going to show all the new people again what my dust extraction system is. And then I'll show you how well this air filter is working because it is absolutely fantastic and it's made an absolute uh, brilliant difference. It's a palpable difference when you walk into the workshop. I highly recommend whatever brand or whatever one is available to you to get yourself an air filter system. So let's jump in and have a look. Okay, quickly, the dust extraction system that I have, it's as I've said loads of times before, it's a DX4000 dust extractor. It is a, gets down to below 0.5 microns, so it gets rid of all the um, dangerous dust. And yes, this is powerful enough to run a dust extraction system. I know you guys keep asking me that. It absolutely is, it's extremely powerful. I just built a little car for it, so uh, I can wheel it around the shop and I can use it as my shop vac as well. And I can just wheel it over here and plug it into my dust extraction system. So yes, this will run your dust extraction system, absolutely no problem. It's plenty powerful, I'll demonstrate that now. And update on the dust extractor itself, some of you guys wanted to know, it's perfect, does the job. It's a pain to empty as all dust extractors are, so take it outside, wear a mask, empty it, bring it back in, no problem whatsoever. And the capacity is the size of the barrel layer, so for a big professional shop, it would be too small. For my shop, it's perfect. So let's get it plugged in, I'll give you a demonstration. Okay, so I just have a, loose hose, flexi hose left here that I can wheel it over and hook it on. It's a twin motor system. So all the um, blast gates are closed now. So you're going to see how strong this thing is. It'll suck itself into the wall when I switch it on. So you can see the pressure or the system is good. Everything is nice and sealed and there's plenty of power in this at all the machines, which I shall show you now. Okay, here's my blast gates. They're made by Charnwood. They're not particularly expensive or anything like that, but they do the job. Now, one change I did make to the system was I faced the blast gates down the way. So, material was gathering in the top of these when I had them the other way around, and it was stopping the blast gates from closing properly, so I was losing um, pressure on the system. So, by facing everything down and having it slide down this way, nothing stays up here. So, that sorted that problem out for me. So, you can see just how much pressure there is there loads. Okay, here's my bandsaw. As you can see, loads of pressure there. Okay, this is the hose for my pillar drill and I plug this up to my uh, downdraft sanding box as well. So, see down here, plenty of pressure too. No issues there. Okay, so the miter saw station, this is another question I get asked a load in comments in various videos, is how is this working? Is it doing the job? Yes, it's absolutely 100% better than what it was before I put this on it. Is it a 100% effective? No, still a little bit of dust get out, but it is so much better than just having nothing around the dust extractor. And there's plenty of pressure there since I went around and sorted out the system and resealed everything. I have a ton of pressure here, and this is right at the end of my uh, four inch pipe or my 100 mil waste pipe. And there's a ton of pressure, air pressure, been pulled down the gully here. And I also have it used in tandem with a shop vac down here, which helps as well. So so I'll try and demonstrate this to you now. I'll just give you um, a quick look at how much pressure is actually available in this gully. Okay, so here's the gully. Hopefully you guys can hear me, but uh, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you can hear that. It's enough to suck your hand in, so there's, a there's plenty of pressure there, and that's the end of my system. So you can see that record power dust extractor 
does the job and it is more than powerful enough. Okay, so next up, the air filter. So this is the Axminster Trade AT25AFS. This is the trade rated one. For the size, Axminster were the cheapest. That's why I went with them. And this thing, I have to say, is absolutely fantastic. I highly, highly recommend you get yourselves an air filter. No matter what brand you go for, whatever budget you're on, whatever size your workshop, get one of these things. The difference I noticed the next day after using this, working back into the workshop, the difference in the air quality, it's night and day. It is actually palpable. You see it straight away. You can see the state of the the air filter after a few weeks of use you can ask the amount of dust that's been taken out of the air and health is wealth and you can just leave this thing run for an hour or two hours or four hours after you leave the workshop just hit the timer button it'll switch itself off you come back in and the air is clean and it's taken a massive amount of air out or dust out of the um, atmosphere and it gets down to nearly 0.1 microns so that's down to the really fine dust now after the day i installed it i went around with a compressed air the hose in the compressed air and i blew off everything in the whole workshop got all that dust into the air set this thing up to run on for a few hours went out and came back in the next day and the workshop was beautifully clean and spotless and this thing had done its job and sucked a load of um, dust out of the air and the great thing about it it's not very loud that's on the highest speed there now it's not too offensive. You can happily walk around in here and work, work with this thing running and it doesn't get too annoying whatsoever. And it's there the whole time. It pulls a massive amount of air through. So it's cleaning the air as you work. So it's nice. The lead is right there. Um, my planer thickness are right there. If I'm sanding right here, it's just behind me. And uh, yeah, I can't recommend them highly enough. Whatever brand you go for, get yourself an air filter. I can tell you the difference in the workshop is night and day. Okay, next up I want to address a couple of errors that I made so I don't give out any wrong information. Let's do that now. Okay, first mistake I made was in the installing this router lift into this router table. So the router table upgrade, this is the saute or mini lift and the increments on the dial are actually 0.1 of a millimeter. So each increment is a 0.1 of a millimeter adjustment. One full rotation is four millimeters of adjustment. And some of you guys spotted that in the video. So yeah, the eagle eyed amongst you saw this. So yeah, the, it's a beautiful smooth action on this, I have to say. And a number of you guys actually inquired about this. So Andy from Sautier got back to me, said he got some interest in it. And some of you guys were asking in Australia for this to be shipped. And I think he said to me, it's $80 uh, US dollars, I think, to have something shipped, or 80 euros to have something shipped to Australia. So that's how much it is. And it's 0.1 of a millimeter. So a tenth of a mil, it's not one millimeter each adjustment like I said in the video. Small thing, but you know, don't wanna give out any wrong information. Okay, and so the next mistake I need to clear up, and some of you guys saw this straight away and pointed it out in the comments, so fair play to you guys. On the last project that I did, which is the centerpiece light for the Whiskey Room series, which some of you guys seem to be really enjoying, which is absolutely fantastic. I made the bow ties from walnut like I did with the table, but this time I cut them cross grain, just not thinking, marked them all out, cut them, cut them across grain, and if you do that, at, right at the waist of the, um, bow tie you can just snap it like a twig it'll just break but i hammered them all in glued them all in place never thought of it the first ones i all cut out was lengthways long grain which is what you should do that's where the strength is if you cut a piece of timber cross grain like that you can just snap it like a twig so there's no strength so just want to clear that up i don't want to give out any bad advice or bad practice if you guys go in and copy what i did but some of you spotted it straight away in the comments so fair play to you so don't cut your bow ties out cross grain always cr cut them out long grain and that'll add to their strength so there you go small thing but a very important thing Okay, so next up is your questions. Now I put out on the YouTube community tab. I'm not sure does that get out to everybody. Um, hit the bell icon on the videos so you get notified because YouTube don't send out all my videos to all my subscribers or even all my messages. So if you guys aren't getting the messages, make sure and follow me on Instagram and uh, hit the bell as well so you get these. Some of you saw it and some of you asked questions. So I'm gonna to get to you guys' questions now and these are gonna be off the top of my head so I haven't pre-prepared this, so here we go. First question is from Leaf and Leaf asks, have you ever made Christmas gifts for people uh, and what kinds, if any? Yeah, well, I've made a few things. Last year, I made a jewelry box for my wife and I bought her some nice earrings and stuff and wrapped them up in the jewelry box and gave her that. Uh, best little gifts to make I find are like little keepsake boxes. So boxes like this, things like that always go down well with people because people always have nice things to um, 
to store in little boxes. I also gave away some of the um, chopping boards as gifts that I made in a previous video. So little things like that I have uh, in fact given as Christmas gifts and they always make handmade stuff I think is a fantastic Christmas gift, especially if you make the gift with the person in mind and you know exactly what you wanna make for that person. So the answer to that question is yes, and my phone has gone off. So next question. Okay, so Brendan Lanan asks, uh, do you find it hard balancing your day job with your YouTube channel? Yeah, it's when I'm busy in work, it's very, very hard. Um, this is almost becoming a full-time job for me you now, YouTube. And uh, I also have a full-time job and business to run as an electrician. So I do feel pressure if I'm not putting out enough content or if I'm not getting stuff done. I have a very understanding wife. She's absolutely fantastic. And she's a brilliant mother as well to my little daughter. So um, she really helps me out a lot. And uh, she really backs, gets behind me in this. Without that, I couldn't actually do this. And uh, it does take up a whole pile of my time. So usually I'm rushing in videos. It's because I got home from work, ran down to the workshop, turned on the camera, and I'm trying to make a project. So I could be out here from all hours of the night trying to film. And then filming makes everything 10 times longer as well. And this doesn't generate any money. It costs money to do, but it's a hobby that I love doing. And the channel is growing. Maybe sometime down the road, it might start to uh, generate a bit of income. That's what I hope anyway, because I'm putting a lot of work into it. So it would be nice to get something back. And, you know, it would be nice to get outside the Irish economy, a little bit of stability. So yeah, something from YouTube down the road, maybe selling some of the stuff that I'm making. But uh, yeah, it does get hard at times. I do feel pressure, especially now that the channel is growing and there's 18,000 of you guys now subscribed to the channel. I do feel pressure to make content and keep the channel up going and getting good information out to you guys as well is very, very important. So yeah, it's hard, it's hard. And now I have the whiskey channel as well. But that's a lot easier, that's a bit of fun. I can come down and have a little sup of whiskey and tell some stories, tell a bit of history, have a few laugh and a bit of jokes. That's what that one is, a bit more lighthearted, a little less effort. Um, I do do a bit of research into the whiskey videos, all right, to get to you guys the history for the whiskey bottles and put a couple of stories to it. So there's a small bit of work in that, but that's a little bit more fun. So if you've not uh, seen my whiskey channel yet, I'll link it below. Again, I know I've said this about 10 times, but come on over and uh, hit the sub button and a bit of crack, a bit of whiskey and a bit of laugh. But yeah, there you go, Brendan. It is, um, YouTube is a job you pay to do. It's not a job you get paid to do unless you have millions of subscribers. So there we go. Um, Martin uh, Runstrom, I hope I pronounced that, pronounced that right. Uh, Martin, how about more guitar making? Well, I've answered this one in a number of workshop vlogs. I love guitar playing and I love guitar making, but I just don't get time anymore. I am flat to the mat with my business and now trying to make YouTube videos. I don't get to practice guitar anymore. I don't get to play guitar anymore. So it's kind of really gone off my radar. And the cost of building guitars is quite expensive and then nobody ever wants to buy them. So it took me ages to sell the last guitar. Um, you know, people are very, very picky. Musicians are very, very picky when it comes to their guitars. Some guys, if it doesn't say Gibson or Fender on it, they're just not interested. The market is very, very small and it's a niche of a niche. So the woodworking um, video kind of industry on YouTube is a niche and the guitar making is a niche of that niche. So the videos don't get any views. The gear costs a fortune if you want to make a good guitar. It's, you could spend 600 euros just on parts alone and that's not including the wood or any of that and your labor. So yeah, if you weren't getting a couple of thousand for selling a guitar, it really isn't worth your time. And uh, like I say, nobody watches the videos, even though I love playing and I love making guitars. So hopefully down the road, I want to make an acoustic guitar. I think I said that before. That is definitely a project I would love to do. But again, you have to go get the jigs and put all the, uh, the money and expense into it. That's why I'm not doing the guitars. The small, nice woodworking projects have a mass appeal and I'm getting most enjoyment out of them. So that's kind of where I'm focused at the minute. So there we go. Next question. Okay, next question. Christopher Davis. Do you believe duct tape fixes everything? I think it can just fix about just about anything, Christopher. So yes is the answer to that. You have to have a bit of duct tape. If you don't have duct tape in your workshop, you're not ready for anything. If they had duct tape on the Titanic, it probably wouldn't have sank. You could have patched that hole. They probably could have wrapped Chernobyl in that stuff as well and it would have been fine. Would have been grand, no problems at all. Could have just continued on. So yeah, duct tape is fantastic and it just does so much and you can wrap everything in duct tape. So the answer to that question is yes. Duct tape fixes just about everything. Okay, next question. I just took a fit of coughing there. I think I swallowed a fly. It's not coronavirus. So 
don't worry. So next question. I was halfway through this question already when I started coughing, so now I have to go back and do it again. Eric Glasgow, he says, Hello John, I love both your channels. Long time whiskey drinker and novice woodworker here. I know woodworking is a lifelong journey and process in which you are always learning. How long have you been woodworking and what point did you start to be pleased with your final product? Yeah. Well, it is a lifelong journey and the journey is definitely um, more important than the destination, as they say. Right, good job loving both channels and you're into the whiskey as well, so yeah, good stuff. Now, uh, how long have I been woodworking? Well, seriously woodworking for just a couple of years, maybe four years tops. I've been kind of making stuff all my life, but I finally had a workshop. This only got built a um, year and a half, two years now I think I'm in here, and I was over my uh, workshop in my garden shed where I started kind of get really seriously getting into woodworking there. So that's only a few years ago. Like I say, I'm an electrician with 20 years, so I've been around trades and making stuff all my life. So some of that skills I was able to take over into the woodworking thing. And uh, so yeah, seriously woodworking for maybe four years. So that's what I'm at. And uh, when did I start to be pleased with your final product? Well, I'm always pleased if my final product is better than my last product. That's how I judge things. So don't, don't ever compare yourself to, anybody else out there, just compare yourself to who you were yesterday, I think is how the saying goes, not to who anybody else is today. So when I'm pleased, I'm ple like you're never fully pleased with your final product, there's always flaws, and when you go back to it again, maybe a month or two later, you can really pick out the flaws. But don't be too hard on yourself, I am, I do that, I go and pick flaws and everything, but as long as my product is to a level that uh, I've made improvements over the last attempt, then I'm more or less happy. And uh, yeah, I'm kind of at the level now, I suppose, where I can make nice things and I'm, I feel happy to give them to people as gifts and stuff. I can maybe start charging for some of the stuff that I'm making now. I think some of the stuff that I've made has been pretty nice, but uh, yeah. I don't know, are you ever truly happy? That's kind of the thing, <laughs> but uh, I hope that answers your question. I'm kind of waffling a bit. So Tony W, how are you sourcing timber? Hardwoods like Oak, Elm and Beach during COVID. Do you have a local timber merchants struggling here in England with not being able to uh, visit merchants easily? Well, I'm in the same predicament. Now the beach and the oak and stuff, I bought all that before the lockdown. So that's been in my shed seasoning for ages. I actually done a video when I first picked that stuff up um, before I've started to the live edge coffee table. So I got all that stuff before this whole lockdown nonsense started. Um, I have a local timber merchant, somewhere just in the road, McMahon's and uh, the guys in there, I know some of the guys in there in the yard, so they are pretty good to me. Um, I can just fly in there and grab what I want when I need it. That's all hardwoods, but the live edge stuff, at the minute I can't go and get anything as well, like, so I can't get any the live edge planks, I can't even go and get the whiskey bar that I wanted to get at the minute because we're all on lockdown. So. I'm lucky in so far as I have a local hardware merchants, like I said, McMahon's, and I know the guy's in there, so. Uh, but for everything else, I'm in the same boat as you now. I'm stuck. So there we go. Uh, Jake O'Donnell, are you going to do more lathe projects, and what about making pens, and would you ever buy a big belt sander? Um, yes, I am going to do more lathe projects. I quite work, enjoy working on the lathe. Uh, making pens was something I did want to do, and would I ever buy a big belt sander? Um, a big belt sander. I definitely want to get a bigger sander, either, either a belt or disc sander. I could do something, do with something with a real flat, straight edge for when I'm doing curves and stuff on it. So yes, something I, I want to get is a bigger sander. I'm not sure what type yet, but I definitely do need one. So yeah, yes is the answer-ish to that. Okay, next up we have Lynn Jeremy. And Lynn asks, uh, which is your favorite whiskey? Is woodworking like art where you always find just a touch more needs doing? I'm a complete novice and I can't seem to find the final satisfaction with projects. I know it's a journey that's important and I'm enjoying the journey. Well, uh, that's great that you're enjoying the journey, Lynn, and it is the journey and getting better and progressing and just being out making projects, that's the most important thing. Uh, getting creativity, so it is kind of like art, I suppose, in a way, but you still need a functional item at the end of it, so maybe that's not quite like art, but you do get to express yourself um, creatively, which is most important, and you are enjoying the journey. So don't be too hard on yourself. I think this kind of ties into what Eric was asking, um, am I ever happy with my final product? And you can't seem to find the final satisfaction projects yet. Just stick at it, it like you, your skills will develop, you'll be able to express yourself more. You, the more tools you add, the better you get at it, the more, the more your voice in what you're creating grows. Um, to kind of put it, I suppose, like that, in that kind of way. But um, yeah, um, and again, 
like I said, don't beat yourself up too much if the products, I always make mistakes. You see, you guys see me make a mistake. I make mistakes in every single product or in every single project. And as a lot of wood worker, will tell you and a lot of wood turners will tell you mistakes aren't mistakes they're just uh, interesting design choices so that's the way you see them and they're always an opportunity to learn so compare yourself to where you were a few weeks ago or a few months ago and then you can see your progress and then you start to get some of that real enjoyment about what you're making because it is a journey and it is progression and if you see people out there making beautiful stuff well just know that they were where you were at at one stage if you're struggling to get some stuff right and uh, stick with it it is a journey and you will get better and you will start to see, um, you will start to take real, I suppose, pride and stuff in your finished product. That will happen, it will happen, just stick with it. And what's your favorite whiskey? Well, at the minute, I think Redbreast 12 or Green Spot. Irish single pot still whiskies are my kind of go-to at the minute. I really like them, and when they're done really well, I think they're some of the best whiskies in the world. So I think Redbreast 12 is certainly up there, and I highly recommend that one. So hopefully that answers your question, Then I know it's probably a bit all over the place, but uh, yeah, definitely stick with it. If you're enjoying the journey, then you have the, the right mindset, and none of us are ever truly happy with our work, which is why we're always on to the next project. So maybe that answers your question, hopefully. So next question. So next up, Andrew Black, and Andrew asks, uh, Hi John, love, or hi, love the channel. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made on a project? Did you fix it, and if so, how? Well, I've made loads of mistakes on a project. Um, I suppose the nice thing about wood is uh, you can always add more wood to wood, and some things are, um, I suppose, savable and redeemable. I've never made a really catastrophic mistake. One of the biggest mistakes I made was making this guitar. I still have the piece here, I'll show you now. So I was making the wings to go either side. So it's a neck true design. Um, so the neck is all one piece. It's all that is the neck. And the neck is carved out with one piece in the body. But there is one of the wings, one of the original wings. So you can see how much smaller that is than what it's supposed to be. So I ran this over the planar thicknesser and took a huge, a piece of snipe out at the end of it and this was cut from the same piece as that side so I was trying to match the grain so that was a bit of a nut buster and uh, I almost had a little cry in the corner so the guitar turned out absolutely fine and fantastic plays great sounds great and uh, yeah so things like that do happen but you can recover never panic too much because like I say you can always wood is a very forgiving medium so long as you're not trying to grain match too much, it can be a very forgiving medium. And like I say, mistakes often turn into interesting design choices. So yeah, there we go. That's one particular mistake. I've made plenty of mistakes in my professional career as well as an electrician. Things have gone wrong, but nothing that I couldn't record for or nothing that I couldn't put right. But uh, yeah, I remember I smashed a glass door on a brand new oven once when I was putting it into a kitchen. Now, luckily, it was for a particular builder. We were doing a row of houses, series houses that were being fully finished and fully kitted out. But I just left a, this one, this big expensive ovens down on the ground, and the whole front of the door just went Psh! That was another one of those times where you just want to pack your bag and go home. But uh, luckily, like I said, the builder was sound out, and he just rang the company, and they put a new door on it, and that was all. So there we go. Mistakes happen. Life goes on, and we get over them. There you go, Andrew. So next up, let's see. Okay, next up, HP, you being an electrician and all, could you advise me uh, how to get power to my workshop slash shed? I'll be building in the new year without having mains connection for the house tanks. Now, the last bit of that, I'm kind of a little bit unsure what you're saying, that you don't have a mains connection for the house or you don't have a mains connection from the house. Because if your house is not powered up, if it's a brand new house, a new build with no power there, you'll have to get that sorted. But again, that's an electrician. So I'd say that's not what you're saying. So you don't have a cable from the house to the shed. Well, again, my best advice to you is to contact a local electrical contractor, they will put you right. But what I would say is a 10 square uh, SWA, depending on, I'm not sure where you are in the world. Now, maybe you're in the UK or maybe you're in Ireland. If you're UK and Ireland, this will apply to you, but if you're somewhere else, it might not. But I ran a 10 square cable to my shed. Again, it greatly depends on how far away the shed is from the house that's going to determine the size of the cable. Not just the load distance also makes a difference to the cable because the cable has resistance and the longer the cable, the higher the resistance, the more the voltage drops, the larger the cable you have to put in. The current carrying capacity of the cable also drops. So there's a lot in that. Again, it's kind of a how long is a piece of string type of thing, but you're going to have to get, if it's just a shed in your, say your back garden at your house, if that's what you're saying, you're going to have to get a cable from your consumer unit. So your fuse board in your house, your main consumer in your house, get that out to your shed somehow. So however you're going to do that, get an SWA, a steel wire armor cable, and as big as you're going to need. So again, I don't know what you're putting into your workshop, 
If it's something similar to mine, a, a three by 10 square would be fine. If it's bigger, uh, by your message, I don't think it is. You're probably just a hobbyist like myself, so you might need that bigger than that. But uh, just be wary of load and be wary of the distance from your house and uh, ask your electrician to make sure that you give you, he gives you plenty of spare capacity on the cable out from the house. That's my advice to you. Don't go too small. Always go bigger than what you need. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's safer in the long run and you always allow room for expansion as well. So that's my advice on that one. So next question. Okay, last two questions and my voice is starting to go, so just as well. Uh, JD Agri Photography asks uh, or says, love the videos, I'd like to see a barstool project that would be good, might tie in with the whiskey channel. So yeah, definitely something I wanna do is build some sort of chair or stool. I haven't made any kind of chair yet in my woodworking adventure, so that's definitely something that's on my radar. So maybe a barstool might be a good suggestion. I'll take that one on board, JD. I'll uh, let that run around in the head for a while and if I see something that takes my fancy and we can make a barstool, we'll definitely do it. So yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. And Cage D asks, this is the final question. Hi John, I hope you ha I hope to have a steel shed up in the next few months and start my own woodworking adventures. Fantastic. Uh, I love to know how you set up the OSB wall sheeting in your shed panel thickness and how you attach the top and bottom supports. Love the channel. Thank you. Well, Cage. Um, I have a video on it. Actually, it's one of the first videos I made in the shed. Now, they're not great quality videos. It's back before I was, I was only getting into this old YouTube thing, but I showed the, the entire fitting out of this shed. So you can see that in this video. So if you go back to my videos, you'll see it exactly. I put a six by two top and bottom into the steel structure. So into the web of the steel, I was able to put that top and bottom, fix that in place, and then use that as a fixing for my OSB sheets. And then the shed has a steel rail that runs around the middle. So I still use self-tapping screws they, um, you know the, the screws, they have their own drill bit attached to the front of them and they self-tap then into the steel, it cuts its own hole and then threads itself in. So that's what I used for uh, mounting the OSB sheets. It's half inch OSB and uh, OSB is a great option to go for because it's extremely cheap and you get one really nice side on it. So keep the really nice side out and you can paint it and it's grand. But when you're doing it, make sure if you're gonna be hanging anything from the wall to put supports in place. So think ahead, put extra timber in the wall if you have to because these steel type sheds, there's not much support in the walls. They're a very light structure. They go up very, very fast. They're a great option to go for, but again, they're not like a super strong structure where you can hang loads of stuff off the wall. So hopefully that answers your question. There's a full video of me kidding out this workshop. So go back and check that out. I'll, um, actually, I'll link it there for you now. So that should help you out. So there we go, questions answered. Okay guys, there we go, that's your questions answered. And that's kind of getting to the end of this workshop vlog. So I don't have too much updates for the channel. Again, everything is up in the air. I think that's true for every single one of you guys out there with this whole lockdown, unlockdown, lockdown. We don't know what way COVID's gonna go at the minute. So I can't give you and make any promises as to what's coming up on the channel because I'm not sure where I'm gonna get my materials from over the next few weeks, but there's definitely gonna be projects. I can't promise you that. So I hope you're all doing well wherever you are in the world and that you're getting through this lockdown. It's not affecting you too much and uh, look after them mental health, that's the most important thing. So get out, make something, whatever it is, get out for a walk, all that kind of good stuff. Um, terribly important in this current climate that we look out for each other and uh, definitely keep take care of the body and the mental health. That's the best advice I can give you. And uh, hopefully this content uh, alleviates all the nonsense and you get a break when you come here and hang out. So there we go. Um, the channel, what can I say about the channel? Well, I've just passed 18,000 subscribers, which is fantastic. So we're coming up to the end of the year. I set myself a goal of reaching 10,000 subscribers this year and I got 18,000 so far. So that's absolutely brilliant. I do notice every time I upload a video now, somebody immediately hits the dislike button. So <laughs> I have to wonder, is it the same person or is there someone trolling me or trolling me or what? It's, it's quite hilarious to see, but that's what happens, I suppose. The more people come along, the more people will like and dislike your content. But I always laugh as soon as the video goes up, dislike. So I'm just wondering, is, is someone that knows me uh, winding me up? Could be, could be. Um, again, I have the Whiskey channel, so definitely come over, hang out over there. I will link that below and the Whiskey Instagram and stuff. So come on, it's a bit of a laugh, a bit of crack. I'm reviewing some whiskeys and I'm telling some Irish history and some stories to go along with every one of the bottles and a few jokes. And I'm trying to uh, give an Irish toast at the end of every video. Like I said, I'm gonna run out of toast pretty quick, but there's a hell of a lot of Irish toast, so we won't run out too soon. So yeah, I'm doing a lot of research and stuff just to tell some stories and give you a little bit of history about Ireland. And hopefully I'll get to go around Ireland to the distilleries and stuff when this lockdown uh, lifts and show you some Ireland through the whole whiskey channel. So definitely come over and uh, hang out there if you've not already. Again, I'll link it below. And uh, thanks for all your support and I hope you're all doing well out there. I'm gonna wrap this up now because I'm rambling. And uh, yeah, look after yourselves in the current climate, guys. And I'll see you in the next video. Oh, happy Halloween as well. Have a good one. See you in the next one. <laughs>